Well, thank you so much uh, also to Carla and to World Affairs. Um, this has been a really fun pilot project this semester. Uh, as Carla mentioned, I'm now back from the State Department and have taught this semester a seminar at UC Hastings called Democracy, Technology, and Security. Uh, and in conjunction with that seminar, uh, we've had uh, three really interesting events so far, and this is the fourth. Uh, and as you can tell, simply from the lineup, uh, you're in for a real treat tonight. So uh, glad to see you all here uh, and really look forward to the conversation. Um, so we're going to jump right in and uh, really try to tease out tonight some of the fundamental questions that we are facing uh, both you know, domestically and globally in terms of the relationship between the private sector and governments in uh, securing our cyber infrastructure, in preventing, deterring, and responding to uh, you know, what we, we may call cyber attacks tonight uh, in, a, in a sort of non uh, term of art sense, you know, malicious cyber activity uh, or unauthorized intrusions of various sorts. Uh, and again, I can't think of a better set of folks to discuss these issues you have before you, as you heard from Carla, uh, vast experience in both government and the private sector uh, that, that my guests are drawing from in trying to think through uh, these, these issues. So the White House's Council of Economic Advisors uh, reported back in February of this year uh, that malicious cyber activity cost the U.S. economy between $57 billion and $109 billion in 2016. And that's a, a pretty wide range, but nonetheless, uh, you know, def definitely up there uh, in terms of cost to the overall economy. Um, now, these kinds of activities, as, as you can imagine, are directed at both public and private entities. Uh, and just in terms of thinking of how these uh, activities manifest themselves, uh, we'll hear in more detail later about some of the kinds of intrusions we're dealing with. But uh, to begin with, you might think of denial of service attacks, right? When you're, you're trying to get onto a website or to access something and you're prevented from doing so. Uh, business disruption, sometimes accompanied by demands for ransoms of various types. Uh, theft of proprietary data. Um, we had yet another uh, indictment dropped today from DOJ relating to uh, cyber espionage and trade secret theft, theft of intellectual property, uh, and also theft of sensitive financial and strategic information. And, and those of you who uh, were here who've had a chance to watch uh, last week's program on foreign election interference also uh, heard about, uh, and for that matter, if you just read the press in the last couple of years, have seen other uses of uh, illicitly obtained data, be it in the form of, of emails or other types of personal information. So this is really a pervasive problem. Uh, the Council of Economic Advisors also pointed out, I think, a, a persistent problem in this space, which is that private companies both bear the brunt of a lot of this activity, uh, but are also not properly incentivized necessarily to respond to it in a way that would prevent uh, you know, what we might call, uh, in a technical sense, negative externalities, right? In other words, to prevent harm that goes beyond just uh, their specific business or their specific networks. Uh, and so we've really got a, a discrepancy here, a mismatch in terms of what companies are both capable of doing uh, and then incentivized to do in terms of their business models. Uh, and we also have the problem, of course, um, folks have for a long time been concerned about cyber attacks on critical infrastructure, infrastructure that may be operated and maintained by governmental entities, but particularly in the United States, uh, that is often uh, maintained by private entities. Uh, and so a whole lot of things to talk about in a fairly short time. Um, but I'm going to start off uh, you know, by asking each of our speakers uh, to tell us you know, what you think is the number one challenge that, that we need to confront, and particularly thinking from the private company perspective, uh, the number one challenge that private companies you know, here in, in 2018, against the backdrop of what I've just described, uh, are facing uh, in terms of, of their planning and decision making. Uh, well, first, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, and it's somewhat, I guess, ironic because just this morning I had to do my cybersecurity training for the Aspen Institute. So I feel very well prepared to answer this question. The number one problem that companies are facing are their own people. 
Um, so one of the challenges uh, in the cybersecurity training, uh, you know, you're given this email and it says, here are seven different flags that you're supposed to follow. And frankly, even for somebody working in the field, some of these are kind of confusing. It's like, well, the email doesn't sound quite right. Well, what does that mean? Or, you know, here's a link that is meant when you hover over it to look the same as the thing that you're clicking on, but it has just a tiny character change. Well, we all get hundreds of emails every single day. How are we going to possibly uh, maintain uh, keeping on top of it? So, uh, so I think the challenge has a couple different dimensions. One is, how do we actually train our people to be able to respond to these challenges, especially uh, as we were talking earlier today? You can be tired. You can be put under pressure. You can feel, uh, as I, at a previous World Affairs uh, speech happened, an individual clicked on one of these emails because he was told that he was under legal investigation. And sure, he wanted to click on that link real quickly, didn't think it through. He also worked in cybersecurity, right? So, so that's one side of it. Then the other side of it is, what can we do um, in industry to actually take that uh, challenge out of the human. I have to say that if the link doesn't match, a computer can probably tell that better than our eye can, right? So why are we leaving that to the human to sort that out? So overall, the challenge is you know, getting our humans prepared, and there's both technology and human solutions to that problem. So I, on the enterprise side, I think the Betsy's right on like the, the, the vulnerability of the workforce. The other problem we have is just a huge lack of qualified people who have the ability to play with the big boys, so to speak, um, to, to actually stand up against a determined, skilled adversary. Um, when you think about like the Sony North Korea incident, a lot of people looked at that and made fun of, of Sony Pictures for, for how how poorly they responded. But the truth is, is the vast majority of the Fortune 500 would be no better prepared against an adversary like that, which is even not one of the, the top kind of state level adversaries that we have to deal with. And, and we just don't have enough good people with enough deep skills. And as a result, you end up with the security technology industry focusing on building solutions that only a couple hundred com companies can deploy. And there are thousands or tens of thousands of companies in the United States and the West overall that do not have the ability to use the things that are being sold as security protections because they just don't have the right people. On the consumer side, I, th I think Betsy's right. One of the problems we have is that we just don't build software products to be safe in the same way car companies build cars to be safe, right? If you get in a fender bender in a Toyota Corolla, it doesn't explode into flames. And then Toyota <laughs> says afterwards, like, oh, that was user error. You should really not run into somebody at three miles per hour. But that's how we build software, right? Is that totally foreseeable misuses of software are immediately written off as you made a mistake, you gave up your password, you clicked on a link, you're on your own now. And I think that's a, a complete change in how we build software is gonna have to happen where we are much more aggressive about making the proper decisions for people and not putting them in a situation that they're not qualified uh, to build. Um, I'm going to piggyback a little bit on what Alex said in terms of the threats. And, and so, again, I've been doing this for a long time. And the severity and the destructiveness and the significance of the ty types of threats have evolved tremendously over that time from you know, literally script kitties and some viruses. Then you had, yeah, you had Chinese espionage and you had a lot of uh, criminal conspiracies stealing credit card data and personal information. Now I would say probably three out of every four attack is a nation state, a uh, very significant attack. Um, and uh, the response from a regulatory perspective has been, uh, very ad hoc in trying to um, establish uh, standards or quasi standards. It's very ambiguous what, what is expected uh, of companies in terms of the protections within their environment um, and, and what they need to do. And it's industry specific. And then you have states. And then you have um, other best practices that have grown out of regulatory enforcement actions from the FTC and now the SEC, which is. Monday morning quarterbacking to say, you know, looking back, you didn't have reasonable security. Um, so you're in this situation where you have companies that are getting whacked by Russian destructive attacks. For example, NotPetya last year knocked out 90% of Maersk shipping companies' computers, laptops, desktops, emails. Uh, same with the pharmaceutical company Merck, FedEx. 
Um, it was a geopolitical attack, not on those companies, but on any company that did business in the Ukraine, because it was through tax software to file taxes in the Ukraine. So it was a ge geopolitical Russian attack that destroyed uh, companies, shut down pharmaceutical distribution channels. So they're dealing with that and those kinds of threats and protecting against those. And then on the back end, what they get hit with is regulatory inquiries, um, lawsuits from customers or consumers, lawsuits from shareholders. The SEC is now in on this. Um, and so the, the resources, the sheer financial resources, even for the biggest company, with evolving threats, evolving security protections, and, and just evolving technology that they have to implement anyways, is um, even for the biggest company is really, really hard to get your hands around, both in terms of what you're supposed to be doing to, to react and, and where the money is going to come from. So you know, you've already given us a lot to, to chew on and think about here. And so if we want to sort of maybe draw out three categories um, from what you all just said. So one is skills, skills and people with skills and, and you know, what some refer to as the cyber workforce. Um, so I'll take a, a little bit of time to talk about that um, so that we have people who can play with the, the big boys or the big girls, as the case may be. Uh, then talking about uh, the ex ante, right, the design, uh, so, you know, a really interesting analogy we heard about, you know, all of the regulations, right, that go into how you design a car and how you test it um, before it even goes to market. You know, do we need more on the ex-ante regulatory side, whether it's, um, you know, companies getting together and formulating their own best practices or whether it's uh, at the behest of government? You know, what can we do ex-ante? Uh, and then I think Jenny raised some really uh, important ex-post Questions. I mean, that, that blend into the the ex ante, which is the lack of clarity of expectations of companies in terms of what what they're supposed to be doing on this front, uh, both in very practical terms and in, in terms of avoiding liability, but 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 even beyond that, uh, you know, understanding that they will be on the receiving end of this kind of activity. Um, where can they look to figure out what it is that they are supposed to be? Doing and again, that the question arises: Is the the onus, as it were, to develop those kinds of guidelines and standards uh, on government, or is it uh, on the private sector itself? Uh, again, understanding that the private sector is comprised, as we've heard, of, of you know big Fortune 500 companies that at least would have the resources, presumably financially, to do some of this, but also um, you know small businesses that that intrinsically don't. Um, so I. I love to elicit each of your reactions in, in whatever order you see fit to, to that kind of range of issues in terms of, of how do we then solve these problems of building up the workforce, figuring out what needs to be done ex ante, either in terms of private sector and or governmental uh, prescription, and then clarifying uh, what, what companies need to do when they're on the receiving end. <laughs> I guess go the way or? Yeah, which way you go want to go? Go the yeah. other way. Um, <laughs> Well, I, I, I'm going to also piggyback on something Alex said about design. And um, I think a lot of cybersecurity, because it evolves so quickly, has been ad hoc, <clears throat> Monday morning quarterbacking, patching after the fact. And it hasn't been built into systems um, from the ground up. It's been, it's been you know, post-development. Post um, I think we have a chance, as we we're really going into kind of a whole new world here with the Internet of Things and, and the connectivity of everything. And I think we need to get in on the ground floor. And it doesn't necessarily answer, should this be a standards-based thing? Should this be a private industry deciding what the standards are? Um, and it is all driven for the private industry by risk. And that risk could be liability. That risk can be reputational. That risk can be financial. Uh, and the risk can be public safety and health, which is, is the issue with Internet of Things. We're talking about you know, a car. Now, now product liability is, is this car going to be remotely taken control of and, you know, uh, and there's going to be an accident and there's life and limb or 60% of connected devices are going to be medical devices. That's everything from implants, dosing machines to Fitbits. Um, and so we really need to think about and do this right this time, the technology that goes in from design inception 
all the way through the life cycle of the entire product. Um, and from a private perspective, a lot of what I do is figuring out how to distribute the liability if something goes wrong. Because you have a software manufacturer, then you have a, uh, you know, a, a other component parts and integrators and the manufacturer and the hospital who uses the devices. Who's going to likely get sued if something happens? And, who, and how do you distribute that liability in, in a way that, that makes the most sense? But Jenny, let me, let me just stay with you for one second there, because I think what you've pointed to, um, and you know, for those who are lawyers in the room, and as I said, this was you know, a law school class that gave rise to this series. I mean, that is the way that lawyers, off, we lawyers, often think about incentives, right? It's attaching liability to activities that we want to deter. Um, but but that is a very a very reactive way of thinking about and, things. And to your point, actually, the liability so situation, right? Sorry, uh, the liability. Can you hear me? <laughs> situation. You know, you talked about like sharing information and and partnerships and incentives uh, to. Um, I forget how you put it, but incentives to share information and 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 collaborate. Um, the liability is also, on the other hand, yes, it is forcing, uh, as well as regulatory standards, companies to, to really think about uh, protection. But it is also preventing them to go to law enforcement or to seek uh, collaboration and help. Uh, it's a little bit better with information sh sharing. And quite frankly, private companies share a lot of information with each other. They just don't share it with the government because it's a one-way street. I mean, some, some do, but, but there's, there's a, yeah, there's less, it, the, the calculus is what's in it for me. Um, and there's a lot into private sharing of information, but there's, it's, it's, it's uh, less obvious sometimes with sharing government. And that's because they're scared of, they're scared of uh, regulatory inquiries and liability that's gonna result. So it's a double-edged sword is the liability. So one sort of lingering question that, that may remain lingering is how we can incentivize companies otherwise than through things like liability regimes. But Alex, I'd love to hear your reactions on this discussion and then maybe additionally this information sharing piece that Jenny mentioned uh, most recently. Right, so to throw cold water in my own metaphor, the difference between software and Toyota Corollas is when you test a car, Just this is the same as building a bridge or a building, is you're trying to build something safe within a constraints of physical law and of a certain set of things that you know happen all the time. S software security is an adversarial process. So it's really closer to, you know, people will say things like, why can't you build software like airliners? There was you know, no fatal airliner crashes in the United States in 2017. And my answer to that is, well, Boeing is not held responsible for 737s being invulnerable to anti-aircraft fire, right? But that's what building software is like, is that you have enemies who, without anybody punishing them, will figure out smart ways to attack your systems and you're being held responsible for that. And so it's not like building a house or building a car, it's more like playing chess. And you can't learn how to play chess just by going through a checklist of first, you know, move the pawn forward to, bring out the knight, don't bring, you know, if you follow the checklist, you're gonna lose. And um, so when we, we create incentives, I think we have to create incentives, I think for people to care about this. The other thing that we need to create incentives is for collective defense by companies deciding no longer to run their own infrastructures. One of the, the big positive things that have happened in the last 10 years in the enterprise space has been the, in, uh, the advent of cloud computing. The fact that you can build a company from the ground up running almost no software on your own, and instead having Microsoft and Google and Amazon um, and a bunch of other Salesforce and a bunch of companies to run that software for you. And the truth is, is unless you're a defense contractor, an oil company, or one of the top five banks, those companies are definitely better at security than you are, and they're probably better than most of those companies, right? And so that is one of the things we need to incentivize people to do is to not run their own email servers, not run their own file systems, to move to limited computing infrastructures for their corporate environment. But funny enough, the way a lot of the laws lay out, and I'm the, for credit, I'm the only non-lawyer up here, I did feel like a token a little bit, and I realized, because I'm the only electrical engineer, I don't have a JD, so I, I can't really speak to how the laws work here, but my understanding is there's a number of regulations in different industries that make it very difficult to use cloud computing. First thing we can do is wipe that out, right? Like if you're in a regulated industry, you want to incentivize people to do that. And then I think on the information sharing, to, to borrow something from the aviation industry, uh, people in aviation are uh, incentivized to report 
um, non-fatal accidents. There's a, a database that you report it that NASA runs. Um, and this is a terrifying database, right? So go look up like NASA airline accident database and you go read it and search for like incidents at SFO and you'll read these, you know, a pilot says, I was landing in a baggage cart crossed and I missed it by 50 feet, right? And that could have been an accident that hundreds of people died. And they didn't because that that pilot is incentivized to report it. He does not get punished. There is no invest, any investigation is to fix the problem. It is not punitive. But there is no incentive for American companies to do that. Jenny's totally right. Like, you probably honestly hear about three or 4% of the activity that's actually happening against American companies. American companies will not report that they were breached to anybody unless they're absolutely legally required. And the vast majority of breaches have nothing to do with the kind of PII that falls under you know, disclosure laws. And so because they're not incentivized, we cannot learn from the mistakes of others. We cannot draw conclusions around the activities of, of adversaries who are hitting multiple companies. And that is a, a huge kind of regulatory failure to not create an incentive for that. And, and we can probably talk about this a little more. And one of the problems is we have no competent defensive cybersecurity authority in the United States. We have hyper-competent offensive authorities. We have very competent law enforcement authorities. That is not the same as having an authority whose job it is to coordinate these issues and to learn from them and to get that education out. When I was a corporate executive, I was not allowed to go have like a casual conversation with an F FBI agent, right? Like you would definitely not recommend if you were my lawyer for me just to go like chat with an FBI agent about a potential breach. <laughs> you have to go right? through me. <laughs> yeah. And when you bring the lawyers in, they're not thinking about let's make this like a super productive conversation for their job is to protect the liability of the client, right? And um, that's why we need to have the ability for us to, for in the corporate world, to have people we can work with who are not carrying a gun and a badge and are, you know, if you make a slight misstatement of fact, you're not looking at a 1001 violation. Um, that's the kind of thing that other countries have. France has it, Germany has it, the United States does not. Can I, can I mention one thing about the law enforcement? It's a granular piece, but it depends on the circumstance. If you want to talk about a particular case and you're gonna start giving over source code or some, you wanna protect that, you wanna do it for the right reason, you don't wanna open up a can of worms because yep. under our constitution, you know, courtrooms are our public forum and, and you cannot uh, ensure confidentiality. If you wanna share more generally what are called indicators of compromise, like we're seeing kind of these kinds of IP addresses or we're seeing this kind of behavior, that I would say is a good thing to do, yeah. is to develop a relationship to share more generally, not linked to a particular matter that you are gonna then, it's gonna come back to, to hurt you and slam you in the, in the media and the pub, uh, public. And that, and that does happen, to be clear, it's just, it does feel like a one-way street, except in very specific circumstances. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think what this whole conversation is showing is you know, something that we're beginning to think about at Aspen, which is that the entire regulatory structure of issues like cybersecurity, one, there's not much there. Uh, we, you know, I used to work in immigration. There were all sorts of specific laws and all sorts of specific rules. Here, it's kind of the Wild West. You're just starting to see either old laws being applied to new cybersecurity issues or thinking about new ways to regulate these issues. Um, and fundamentally, we're thinking about, you know, the word regulation has probably come up more than any other word here. Maybe there are innovative ways, you know, we got lots of great entrepreneurs here in Silicon Valley. Maybe not every policy solution needs to be regulation. Maybe there are other ways to incentivize people to be creative and to come to the table together that doesn't require you to create regulated industries in every case. Um, and I don't think because our DC policymakers focus on DC solutions, we haven't gotten even begun to have that conversation. Um, I also didn't want to leave the workforce point without anybody commenting on it because I think it's so crucial. On the one hand, you have different estimates of 1 million cybersecurity jobs open, 2 million cybersecurity jobs open. You have all sorts of new master's degree programs and undergrad specializations being created. So there's huge incentive in the system to try to help start filling these jobs. At the same time, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, new sorts of systems are coming in that will automate many of the things that today cyber analysts are doing. So I think one of the problems that we have is that we actually don't fully understand yet what sort of workforce we need, not today, but in five years, 10 years, by the time we train these people, will they still be relevant and what aspects of their skills are being created? So that's a complication on the workforce side that industry is really going to have to tackle uh, because they need to be 
be prepared not for today's workforce, but for people that can be continually retrained for tomorrow's cybersecurity problems. And, and let's talk a little bit more about um, what's going on in government, or, or more specifically, what's not going on in government. Because as Jenny mentioned, yeah, please. I actually think that there's too much regulation. And can I just to, Ooh, to yeah. piggyback on that and, and why I think that? It's because I think that there has been a, I'll, I'll give you an, a concrete example of what happens once you're, you, you're done with, say, a data breach. You then, and let's say we're in the financial sector, OK? So in the financial sector, you have laws that cover the financial transactional information. You're more than likely going to be licensed in New York as a financial industry sector a participant. And under the New York Department of Financial Services, you have cybersecurity rules that require part more particular kind of prescriptive requirements of your security. They're going to come in and they're going to say, did you have the right security tools in place? You're going to have every state, all 50 states in the United States, where you're going to have data breach notification laws. The states are now looking also back at your security and did you have appropriate reasonable security, which nobody has ever defined. You're going to have the FTC looking at your security. You're going to have now the SEC, if you're a public company, and you're going to be highly regulated financial institution. The SEC is now all over this from an enforcement perspective. Are your risk disclosures correct? Did you have a trading blackout? Did you do these, all, the, all these other things? If you have European customers, you have 72 hours to notify those regulators. Uh, and you have contractual requirements with all the partners you, do, uh, you have contracts with to notify them and to deal with the contractual issues that come out of that uh, if you have any gap in your security environment. So dealing with a simple data breach in the news, much less a Russian attacking and knocking out all your systems so you can't distribute drugs, <laughs> um, is, is a tremendous regulatory uh, kind of nightmare to walk through. And the problem is we don't have any kind of cohesive, comprehensive regulation. We have everybody kind of ad hoc filling the gaps, primarily the states. Um, and and that is that is actually the problem. Um, so that I mean, I think Betsy and Jenny have both pointed out places where the laws could improve in different ways, and it's not about more or less, but it's about smarter and better and more coordinated. Um, but I also did want to take us back to Alex's point about um, bureaucracy, really, um, for lack of a better word, because uh, the notion that we do not only have these tremendous offensive capabilities, um, but that you know, uh, responsibility for developing and deploying those uh, resides, I mean, not in, in one agency alone, but at least in a, an identifiable place with an identifiable command structure. Uh, on the defensive side, Alex, I was intrigued to hear that um, you think we could look to other countries, perhaps, in terms of their approaches, again, on the, on the bureaucracy, or, or maybe you can give me a, a better word, on the administrative level, in terms of not only making that a governmental priority, but uh, having the lines of communication uh, very clearly open. I mean, Jenny, you mentioned uh, in terms of the kinds of conversations, you know, letting folks in government know that you've noticed some suspicious activity at the moment depends largely on, on relationships, on, you know, knowing someone you can call and who you can trust to, to kind of let them know what's going on here. But that is, you know, very ad hoc. And so I'd be curious um, from all of you to hear, you know, if you, if you could design your ideal whether it's an agency or an office that, that sits inside an agency to, to coordinate these sorts of things. What authorities would you like to see them have? What capabilities would you like to see them have? And then I think to a point that Betsy has come back to again and again in other conversations, you know, who Sorry, staffs that? <laughs> no, but you know, who's, who staffs that agency, right? Because I think you've got, you've got the policy people and you've got the technologists and uh, they're only starting to learn to talk to each other if that. Um, so again, and again, another another set of issues to throw out to you. And please do feel free to jump in and and converse with each other about you know what we're going to do on this uh, bureaucratic design and government capacity side of things. Well, part of the problem is that we've gone backwards, right? So there was at least a White House cyber coordinator. There no longer even is that position. So from central U.S. government, there isn't one place that anyone can call. And in general, we've also lacked people who have the technical background to understand a lot of these questions. So, you know, I think one of the greatest challenges we've seen is that, you know, a lot of the people who do cybersecurity, and frankly myself included, 
are not people who have CS backgrounds, are not people who understand the nitty gritty of the technology. And that's not to say that I'm trying to talk myself out of a job, but it is to say that you need to pair pe people who have the deep technical background with folks that can actually work uh, on the legal side and actually have them talk to each other. And oftentimes, we can't even speak the same language. And I think Alex is a great example of someone who has the technical background but does uh, communicate Aww. really well Aww. with folks. Well, uh, <laughs> but so on the structure side, I think you know, creating new agencies, I worked at the Department of Homeland Security. And one of the great challenges is that when you create a new agency, you put a whole lot of people together from inside government who haven't worked together before, who had very different mandates, and you try to throw that all together. So I'm not sure that a new agency, at least one that will be staffed from folks within government, is necessarily the right solution. But we do have lots of examples of other places where we've actually created coordinated efforts from within the White House that then trickles down to various agencies. Uh, you know, you'll have lots of sort of uh, interagency meetings and things like that. And that requires prioritizing this issue. So whatever structure you're going to take on, you need to make this an issue that is prioritized within the White House. And I don't think it's ever been prioritized to the level that it should be. I'm sure I'm biased, but, but I don't think it has been. So I mean, I can, I can dive into the model I did like. So in the fall of 2016, when we were dealing with the aftermath of the US election, trying to figure out what's going on, we were immediately thrown into the, the, the French and German elections. Right? Those were right around the corner. We knew that there was going to be some kind of Russian activity. And unlike in 2016, where um, we didn't really have a partner, so we found some stuff. We turned it over to the FBI. Apparently, that went nowhere, is what we've read from elsewhere. You know, Apparently, it's a real big distance between the, uh, the Hoover building and the DNC headquarters, but you know, I'm not going to. They had their reasons, <laughs> right? Um, unlike in the US, where we had no partner on, on security, and, and the truth is, is tech companies don't really have a single partner right now in 2018, um, and it doesn't look like for 2020. There's a task force in the FBI, a task force in the DHS. They both have very different mandates, and there's already a lot of chaos about nobody being in charge. And part of it is that Rob Joyce, uh, was, was his position was eliminating the White House, and that was his job. Um, but anyway, we went to France. France has a defensive cybersecurity agency. They're called ANSI. They are staffed A-N-S-S-I. Their director is a cryptographer who used to work in their intelligence services. They are mostly staffed of people they've pulled out of the offensive side of the intelligence services. And they are not regulatory. They are defense only. And they do things like they have consulting teams that will go break into French businesses and help them fix it. Right. So they have, they have the ability to work with us because unlike basically every other person that works for a European government, they were not looking just to punish American tech companies. Um, they're somewhat unique uh, in, in European regulators like that. And so we knew we could work safely with them. We could be honest about our shortcomings. We could tell them stuff. I met with them without lawyers. So again, that's a difference. In the US, lawyers in the room, it's all kind of you know arm's length because you're, you're afraid of them trying to get a press release out of punishing you. In this case, these people were only motivated to protect the French election. And one of the benefits was they were trusted enough inside of French society that they were able to work with all the political campaigns and parties, not Le Pen's, but apparently all the other campaigns uh, to work on their security, get their two-factor up, to give us the list of people that might be targeted. We can go run down that list. We can go give warnings. We can provide data back to the government about if anybody's been targeted. That's a kind of partnership that does not exist in the United States. Well, and my understanding is that those precise French elections were considered rather a success story in terms of yeah. the outcome. Right. They did uh, a great job. They, they locked things down. There was some interesting stuff. You know, the Russians did play their playbook. They, they hacked some stuff. They tried to leak it something like 12 hours before the, the French media deadline. Mm -hmm. The French media uh, ecosystem is a little different than ours. And effectively, they all said, we're not going to be manipulated. And they decided not to report out. That's a part of the, of the, the 2016 election that we don't talk about, possibly because there's a number of people in the media who don't want to deal with the difficult speech issues here. But the truth is, is that the mass media got massively played by the GRU, right? That the GRU hacked into the DNC, hacked Podesta's emails, leaked those emails in a way that to reporters who they knew would cover it as, as a scandal. And they were able to set the conversation about Hillary rigging the DNC election and help dominate the last month of the campaign, month, month and a half. Um, and nothing has happened that would prevent that from happening in 2018. If Claire McCaskill's emails get dumped out tomorrow on WikiLeaks, I don't think anybody would act any differently. Um, and that is a problem that we really haven't dealt with and perhaps is almost impossible to deal with. Yeah, and I would just uh, not 
to redo last week's uh, election <laughs> hacking um, program, but uh, you know we have 50 states too, which which um, which France doesn't have, and those 50 states when Obama first said this is. Um, you know, this is a critical infrastructure issue. They said under the Constitution, we run elections on a state level, and they don't have the funds, and, and they don't have the resources, and they don't have the know-how know county to county. I think they've come around a bit with that, but then you see what's going on in the elections just with, you know, voting, and, and you realize that that's, uh, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of politics at play there as well. I mean, um, if we could have 50 state election, that would be way better than the 10,000 election authorities we have right now. Yeah. Right? DHS has a spreadsheet of 10,000 people that they have to contact whenever they talk about yeah. election security. Yeah. It's so amazing. It's, it's hard. Yeah. But, but on, the, on the bigger picture of kind of information sharing is, you know, going back, to, harking back to incentivizing, you know, as I, as I mentioned, there's a, there's a, there's a fear uh, of, of pro providing information, and there's also a sense of it's a one-way street. And um, I mean, one of the models is the CERT run out of Carnegie Mellon, uh, and and you know, kind of, and, and they're trusted. Um, I think a similar, if you have a neutral, non-governmental, you know, out of a university or something else, that's a, a, a neutral broker in this, um, that it's not going to be. Um, um, I, I think you 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 would find a lot more. Um, uh, willingness. I think there's a, a tremendous willingness to share information. As I as I said before, private companies do it with each other through these ISACs, information sharing associations, all the time. Some of it's very low level. Some of it's quite automated. Everything poured into a platform. It's anonymized. It goes out, and um, and I think that the fear is even when DHS is trying to do that is that the they're taking the information in but they're not providing it back and there are, there are reasons for that I you know we're I think you're interested in security clearances but I think that those are fairly easy obstacles when it comes to anonymizing this data this is not human individual data but this is machine data that is used to protect um, protect your environment for the most part. And just to piggyback off that, it's also a problem of this interagency <coughs> issue because even if you're talking to one agency and they say, we promise we're not seeking to enforce against you, you know, even if they'll sign something saying that, you ask them, well, what about other agencies? Can you protect me against the SEC, FTC, you know, name your three-letter acronym? And they say, we can't control that. So that creates a very difficult situation where even when in the U.S. context you're trying to get cooperation, there's no central place to get cooperation from anyone else. And so even if your you know, interests and your you know, effort is as good as it can be, you're not able to get that sort of assurances. And I think that's made it you know, especially difficult in this context. I had a, a meeting where it was all the relevant law enforcement agencies and DHS, and they were pitching us on how they're all working together now. Um, this is in a skiff here in the Bay Area. We all had That's to get a clear secure facility. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, we all had to get you know clearance clearances. We get this briefing, and it's they're all sing, singing off the same hymnal of like, if you have any kind of indication of this kind of stuff happening, you contact us through this one central group, and they will make sure all of us hear. They're all nodding, and about ninety seconds afterwards, after we've broken. I'm going and getting my donut and my, my coffee. <laughs> um, the head of cyber for one of the law enforcement agencies, huge Marine, ex-Marine, puts his hand on my shoulder and says, I don't care what they say, son. If something happens, you still call me, right? <laughs> and I was like, wow, that lasted. That interagency <laughs> process lasted at least two minutes. Like, I hadn't finished the donut yet. Right. Hey, two, two minutes might be a record, Alex, actually. Yeah. I know that, yeah. that's, that's pretty good. So, that. But it's like, that is a, it's a real problem of who do you call and... Um, it is all and ends up on relationships, often from people in the legal team who have worked in DOJ or they've worked in NSA, and so they're calling their friend because they're looking to get. They want to set up. If you're entering the government, you want to do so in a friendly way, and so they're not just going to go through the front door; they're going to go through a back door. But that's that ends up, you know, breaking this information up into different places, and it. it in an incident, you don't really know who you can go to. And again, that's after an incident. Nobody's in charge of prevention. And that's the real problem we've got, is it turns out there's a lot you can do if, as a society, you mobilize about these issues. But there's nobody in charge of that right now. Well, and I think, again, um, switching to some questions from the audience, and I've received some really interesting ones, some of which we've already covered. Uh, and I think this segues nicely to another one, which is the question of priorities, right? So how can we try to make defensive cyber a government priority. Um, uh, one 
member of the audience is asking specifically, can we make it an election issue or a campaign issue? Uh, obviously too late for 2018, but maybe 2020. Is this something that would resonate sufficiently? And in order for it to resonate sufficiently, do we need to have the sort of cyber Pearl Harbor that people talk about? What will it take for this to be a priority. Um, and then number two, uh, also in the realm of priorities, what will it take to make it a priority for companies? So Jenny, um, one of our audience members saying, you know, what can I do to convince my client to spend money on security? You know, what, what will it take? Because I, and I'm going beyond the, uh, the question provided to me here, but you know, taking a little poetic license, you know, I'm telling them till I'm blue in the face, spend money on security, this is what you need to do. And, and they just can't be convinced, obviously with limited resources and multiple priorities to focus on this. Yeah, I think I think it's the type of company and and the size of the company. Um, uh, you know, I, I think again, maybe it's the incentives of being highly regulated. You're going to have more attention if if people are, you know, the board and executives are losing their job after Target or Equ after Equifax, then you you get attention from the top um, and and resources. The bigger problem is there are, you know, we live in a, in a startup community and, and smaller companies and, and they're just trying to create and sell, create and sell. And, and the, the, require, the, 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 the problem is that the requirements on a lot of those companies are just as significant as if you were a bad, big company. Just because you're smaller doesn't mean you have less security risk. It's actually the opposite. You have more security risk. The bad guys know you're the low-hanging fruit. The bad guys know you're developing the software that's going to go into the car or go into um, you know, some other uh, 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 bigger company's systems or products. Um, and, and, um, and so what you're getting there is the pressure from uh, contracts and customers um, and, and security being something that you sell uh, is one incentive. So the, the cloud, you mentioned the cloud. I mean, a lot of people are going to the cloud, but um, it's also being used by Microsoft and AWS uh, as, as a huge marketing um, uh, uh, push is we're secure. Just put everything in, in our in our in the cloud with us, and you don't have to worry about security. Um, there's an economic uh, downside of that, and that is small companies can't, um, you know, they're not they can't complete compete with Microsoft. Um, so um, I think economics. I think security being part of the economic equation. I think privacy, because it has been more uh, more out there and with personal information and um, how it's been used, is is actually much more in the public discourse. Um, whereas cybersecurity, maybe maybe with Internet of Things, going back to Internet of Things, maybe when it's consumer goods. Uh, and and there's an impact just like privacy on your life. Maybe maybe that will be incentivize people to pay attention. Go, kind of going back to the political question is how how do you make people pay attention to this? Yeah, I guess I'd go on the campaign side. Really interesting suggestion, actually. I like the creativity. Um, for those of you in California who have already done your early balloting like I have, though, we have an incredible amount of specificity of the decisions we are supposed to make. And I feel like this would be another How long is lunch breaks for ambulance drivers, right. do you it's, think? Yeah, it's a great question. I feel like. I spent over half an hour yeah. trying to figure that one out. Yeah. And, you know. So, uh, so I'm a little wary of any solution that would require the general public to dig into cybersecurity on a ballot initiative or something like that. I think that well, they, will be treated they tried to the do way. that with the CC right. the consumer. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, but what I do think uh, one of the ways that we can change the conversation right now, government people are having government conversations about cybersecurity, and one of the things that I think gets lost in the conversation is that companies, both big and small, are essentially playing in cybersecurity policy just as much as the government is. And so we need to start thinking about these decision making as not just a government question, but as government companies and the general public together. 
and we need to come up with ways to allow those two sides to have conversations with each other. As I mentioned before, that's a real challenge when technical people are talking technical solutions and policy people are talking policy solutions. And at the Aspen Institute, we're trying to think of some creative ways, and we'll uh, talk more about that in the weeks to come, of how to get those conversations started. Uh, but fundamentally, until we're able to do that, policy is going to remain in the government sphere, and therefore a lot of the work that the companies are doing, are interested in doing, or at least interested in talking about, will get set by the wayside. And so I think that is where I would focus my energy rather than necessarily on a campaign or ballot initiative. Yeah, I would say I'd go a little past that in certain areas all of the game is in the private industry and government's done nothing. When it comes to the attack against the 2016 election, Congress has done nothing. Um, the executive branch has done some things. There are good people who have tried to quietly do the right thing without the White House knowing effectively. Uh, but if, for the most part, the United States government has not responded. All of the interesting policy developments have happened inside of the, the three big social network companies, Facebook, Google, and Twitter. Google being through YouTube, right? Those companies have defined what a political ad is, what an issue ad is, what level of verification you need, what level of financial verification you need, what are the appropriate things to say in a political ad. Those have all been defined by those companies in lieu of the government making any decisions democratically. And that's got a couple of impacts. One, they do so voluntarily so they can stop doing it the moment people stop paying attention. Um, two, it has been done without democratic accountability, so they're making decisions not through a democratic process. Now, not because they want to, but the democratic process is completely broken. Um, but three, it is something being done only by a handful of companies, and there's something like a 1,000 companies in the internet ad ecosystem, and 997 of them are doing nothing, and three of them are doing everything. And that is not how you can actually build a defensive society by only having a couple of highly motivated, super rich uh, companies try to do the right thing and then everybody else keep their head down because they're not not in the press. And so And that's uh, policy, guys. And like that's that, policy. That's policy. At the end of the day, the policy is being set yeah. by companies. Right. That's a Which is one of the theories around the group we're setting up at Stanford is that policy interventions by university have traditionally been to inform lawmakers, but now we need to inform people within the companies because they're the ones who are actually making the policy that changes the world. Um, and they're doing so without the kind of framework, you know, when the when Congress passes a tax bill, they have five hundred white papers they can draw off of. They have lobbyists from every industry. Like, say what you will about lobbyists, at least they make the they surface the different arguments. The companies are making these decisions in a complete vacuum of silence, except like it's just a it's like a huge empty stadium and there's one person yelling, Whatever you do, we'll all be angry no matter what. Right. So like that's what it feels like for them. And so one of the things we've got to do in academia is start to support the policy creation process in industry and build intellectual frameworks to make it both more transparent, but also I think a little more intellectually consistent and not ad hoc based upon emergency to emergency. And can I can I just say a, a, a concrete example that even when there is legislation, they're deferring to the to the companies. Um, so, for example, uh, the Digit Act, which is a bill, um, uh, I'm not sure where it is, it was a Senate bill introduced last year, um, was supposed to be on what are we going to do about the Internet of Things. We want to be out in front of all of this and connectivity, and we don't want to do anything to stifle development and growth and in in innovation. Same arguments from 20 years ago with the e-commerce platform, quite frankly. Um, but, but we have to worry about security. Um, and so their response in this act literally said, we'll convene private companies to figure this out and then tell us what we need to do. And then we'll, so, so it's really all, it is all coming from the companies right now. And they're doing a lot internally um, while they're trying to respond to crazy ad hoc kind of you know, regulatory responses to things. And to do so globally, right? Like, people forget, so 90% of Facebook's users are not Americans, Yeah. right? So, like, we, we obviously have a very America-centric view of these kinds of problems, and we also like solutions that we know are reasonable within our democratic system, but a lot of these solutions look very, very different when implemented in Thailand or Egypt or Turkey, right? Like, um, some of these controls are much more oppressive uh, and so we got to be really careful what levers of power we create while we do this. Well, we've got about 10 more minutes for the moderated portion of this uh, discussion. And so I'd like to throw 
Um, one question to the group about uh, cycling back to the, the cyber workforce issues, because some of our audience members are, are interested in digging into that a little bit more, um, and then maybe shift the conversation a little bit more to this idea of, of nation states uh, and norms in cyberspace that I think is important to cover. Um, and again, as you've already heard, the, the, just the depth and range of expertise of our panelists tonight mean that we could almost have a, a sort of a full uh, a panoply of, of discussions of different topics, uh, and I'll stay here till midnight. But for those of you who um, are interested in, in some of the yeah, issues that have been raised, yeah, right, <laughs> and volunteering into, like, them. Postmodern play, we're actually dead. And, you guys don't, you know, you don't have anything else do to do forever. tonight, do you? Yeah. Um, and some of the, the familiar faces I see, I know you've heard this, but just for those who who haven't, um, World Affairs has on their website now uh, links to the conversations that we've had in this series. Uh, the first one back in September on uh, democracy, self-governance, and social media, in which we talked about. Uh, a number of these content moderation issues, uh, issues around deep fakes and uh, dangerous speech online. Overblown uh, deep the, fakes, sorry. Overblown. Well, there you go. Uh, I should have had I you mean, here with Bobby Chesney and could, uh, go back and forth on it. But yes, okay. and, and well, the problem is, it, and, and as we discussed then, it's... Uh, um, it's just another manifestation of a problem that's been with us for quite some time. Right. Um, I, I love deep fakes because they're obviously fake. Like, th there's a good CS paper that theorizes that you could never, with given equal computation power, you can never create a deep fake that can't be detected by another system. To everybody. I'm sorry, so a deep fake is a, a, a lot of people have done research into can you fake videos in a way that looks realistic? And so, like five, six years ago, a bunch of grad students created a a video of Barack Obama giving a speech he never gave. And so that was like six PhD students spending a year. Now it's something that kids who hang out on Reddit can do in a couple of days um, with a, a graphics card that was built for video games, right? So that the technology's come incredibly far for creating fake videos. But the great thing about deep fakes is they create technical artifacts that you can tell they're faked. What we're dealing with right now is image-based and video-based fake news where um, for example, during the caravan incident, there's a photo of a Mexican policeman who's been hurt during a protest. They just pull that photo off the wire services and say, this man was hurt by the caravan, right? There's no technical indicator. The photo's not fake. It's a real fake. It's a real photo. They just change the context and you create an entire fake story. And so like deep fakes, I think is overblown because the, the problem is actually, it's, it's, if you're gonna do this stuff, it is the most technologically expensive and least effective way to do it. Sorry. No, absolutely. And, and I just, I get, everybody talks about deep fakes. It drives me nuts. It's like, we just, we just like, we spend way too much time talking about it. Absolutely. Well, and luckily that was only one aspect of the discussion, but an interesting one nonetheless. Uh, so I commend that to you. We also did a, a session on uh, data privacy. And so we had an attorney from the Electronic Frontier Foundation here, who's also UC Hastings grad. Uh, and then our most recent one, as you mentioned, was, uh, was our one on foreign election interference with Stephanie Carbon and Matt Tate and Jenny Cohn. So, uh, so all of these issues are absolutely interrelated and need to be discussed together um, and addressed perhaps by our cyber workforce. So circling back to that, um, <laughs> the question <laughs> is, uh, due to the shortage of workers in information security, how do we increase and retain, uh, and I'll you know, cite the numbers that are given to me here uh, on faith, the 11% of women in the space and 12% of minorities? Yeah, uh, I wish I had the answer to that question. Um, I think the first thing you can do is open the pathways. Um, so at UC Berkeley, we worked actually with Facebook to develop a platform that would just basically provide a one-day training to people uh, to teach them the language of cybersecurity. Because one of the biggest barriers we found when talking to women and minorities was that they felt like they didn't want to apply for a job, a cybersecurity job, uh, because they didn't feel like in an interview they would be comfortable or they didn't know the language to put in a cover letter and thought it would be a waste of their time. Frankly, when I went to UC Berkeley, I'd worked in immigration and homeland security for years, and I applied on a whim, and family members told me, there's no way you're going to get this job because you don't know the lingo. And, you know. and nevertheless, they're looking for more than just uh, communication, but people feel more comfortable when they speak the language. Um, and so that was a small piece of what you can do. Um, I also think that uh, it needs to be recognized that cybersecurity does have a lot of CS hackers, but there's an awful lot of other things that uh, people do in the space, whether it's in policy, whether it's in threat um, analysis. I know that on Alex's team at Facebook, he had a lot of people that could cover you know, sort of world affairs and had skills well beyond CS because you need all of those things. But the image in the media is of the hacker in the hoodie sitting in his bedroom by himself 
uh, always a male got by the way, and that's the image that we have. So we really need to change the way this is perceived from the beginning so people feel, you know, from the demand side, like this is a career that is open and exciting to them, which I think it is. So Betsy's right, like cybersecurity has to be bigger from the kinds of people we attract because the lack of diversity really makes it hard for us to build products that are safe for people in their normal lived experiences, right? Like we just don't have the diversity of experiences um, in the people who are designing and building these products. It is doable. So when I was when I was at Facebook, we got our team to 40% women. We got to one less than 50% female managers. We had an odd number of managers. Um, so like uh, we hit that one less and then didn't get there. Um, I wanted to get to 50%. But like that was still, I think, we had the most diverse security team, at least in major tech companies. It's hard, but it's doable. And it's not like too many, um, honestly, too many engineering leaders in the Valley just uh, utilize the difficulty, the lack of uh, women in the pipeline, of diverse members in the pipeline to, to give up and use it as an excuse, and, and, and they give up way too quickly. And like the couple things you've got to do is one, you have to be willing to give people a chance to grow into a job, right? So in the Valley, we do not, we, we interview people with the expectation that on day two, you get your badge and you sit down and you'll be effective in your job. That just means you pass around the same people over and over again. So this isn't just a diversity issue, but from a workforce development issue, you can't only hire people who are exactly like you, right? And we've, we've built all these barriers that will test for certain kind of shibboleths of I have an elite computer science education or I come from this subsector of the industry and it doesn't test whether or not are these intelligent people who are intellectually curious and who are willing to work hard. Um, and uh, like Betsy talked about some of our teams, like we have these threat analysis teams. These are people often with graduate degrees in international relations. People come from like the Fletcher School, GW, Kennedy School. We taught them the tech stuff. That's the other problem is that Nerds like me think that what we do is super hard, and it's actually not that hard, right? Like you take reasonably smart people and you put them in these situations, they will pick it up, but you just gotta give them time to do that. Um, and that, that means building structured training systems. It means building internal internships inside of your team. We built a rotational system where we'd bring in people who were not ready to do one job, and we had them work with every single team. And it took months, but by the end they found a match. They would sit with them, and six, seven months later, um, that they were rocking and rolling, and we had made them incredibly valuable. So, like, there's a downside to this that you 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 end up, uh, you know, you have to attract these people and then make it a good environment so they don't leave. Um, but usually, they have very, you know, people feel like if you give them the chance, they'll be they'll be loyal to the company. Uh, but it's 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 actually not as hard as people think. We just have to kind of give up. Um, we have to be willing to take more risks on individuals, and and that just doesn't happen. Like, people will go in and be like, I'm going to look for folks who are just like me, um, and. And they don't want to say, just like me as a white male, but all of the tests they do, OK, well, great. Have you been going to security conferences since you were 15 years old? Right? Like, <laughs> OK, great. That is technically you're not looking uh, for race or gender or, or national background, but effectively you are selecting for that. And, and it's, it's subconscious, and people just have to be much more conscious of that, and they have to take those risks. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's, a big society, it's a big societal issue. I mean, if you're talking about getting more women and, and minorities into cybersecurity, there is a workforce. It's just half the population is kind of being excluded and not incentivized to join that workforce. Um, and, um, you know, personally, having been a mathematician and then a, a lawyer in cybersecurity, I've been often in the only woman in the room, and and there's a biases, and 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 they're bad, and um, and they're real, and we all need to, to to work on this. And I come from the East Coast, and one of the first things I said in the Silicon Valley, despite being so innovative, it's so retro here when it comes to. Um, gender dynamics. Um, uh, just an example, I was invited to a lab opening for an a, a investor, a VC, and uh, I would say of 200 people in an open house, people coming and going, I saw about five women. I went up to a group, and they were the event planners. Um, that's a problem. Um, and, and, um, and so for me, I do a lot with mentoring girls and them and, and women, other women in technology, uh, and 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 their positions in technology, and um, 
and seeing that there are women who are highly competent on both sides. I also spent a lot of time developing creds by just asking a lot of questions of men who were not going to be kind of jerks, and I'm an IT guy, and you're a lawyer, but who were going to sit down. And I learned a, a whole lot technically from great male forensics analysts. Um, so I don't, I don't want to poo-poo everybody, but it's, it's my responsibility to pay that forward and act as a role model to girls, to women, to college-age uh, women. Uh, to people seeking jobs, to people who are looking for panelists on a panel, um, and I will, I you know, I might be like discriminating, <laughs> but I will give a woman a chance because I just think you, it's an it's a matter of numbers um, and getting getting women out there as this is a this is a cool career and as Alex said, it's not. It's really not rocket science. Science, um, you know. It's it's uh, there's which is a, also a there's cool a career certain, for women. <laughs> well, yeah. There's that's right. Um, there's a certain bravado around cybersecurity, and it grew out of a lot of people in the early days. of cybersecurity came from the Air Force, actually, or the military, where they were trained. And as a result of that, there is a certain bravado with cybersecurity that even in other IT fields doesn't exist. Um, and, and that's not where people are coming out of all the time. Some very good people come out of um, the military, but, but there's so many different channels to enter this field and so many different aspects of it and so many different perspectives than the technical perspective now. Um, um, and that's certainly true for incident response management is you really need everybody at the table to figure out um, what you're going to do with the problem. So. Well, that, that was a phenomenal series of answers, and I think it would be really valuable for people uh, listening to your advice. Um, because of the time, I am going to bring to a close the moderated portion uh, of this uh, event, which means that uh, those of you who are interested in uh, cyber norms and things like that, I can uh, commend uh, the Lawfare blog to you, on which I and some others on the panel uh, have contributed to in the past. Uh, and also, um, speaking of uh, at least one piece of the government that's been more active lately on these issues. Um, I, yet again today, another indictment out of DOJ uh, relating to state-supported uh, espionage in this case, but uh, you've seen a number of uh, indictments in the last six, eight months um, that really do, uh, in very painstaking detail, illustrate the ways in which nation states are behind uh, a lot of the malicious cyber activity that we've been seeing. Um, and I will have a, a piece up at some point in the next couple months on, on attribution by indictment. So uh, keep an eye out for that. But uh, my job now as moderator is a delight because I get to thank these wonderful people for all of their contributions and thank all of you for your fantastic questions. And thanks so much for joining us both this evening uh, and for the other events in, in what has been really a, a pleasure to host uh, as a series here at World Affairs. So thanks so much. Thank